welcome everybody uh, to uh, the DeFord Lecture Series. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Gupta, for joining us today. We're very happy that Dr. Gupta could join us. For, so I'm impressed that he's giving a talk at 2.30 in the morning, although he tells me that this is business as usual. Uh, and I'm going to have uh, uh, Dev uh, you know, introduce Dr. Gupta in just a second. Um, first, um, this is the uh, Fall 21 uh, DeFord Lecture Series, uh, which used to be called Technical Sessions. Uh, the DeFord Lecture Series uh, has been a tradition in the department since the late 1940s. Uh, it started out as a venue for, uh, for graduate students and researchers to disseminate uh, the results of their research and has grown into our venue for bringing in distinguished researchers from around the world. Uh, to present research on uh, all aspects of the geological sciences. Uh, several years ago, we renamed Technical Sessions uh, after Ronald DeFord, uh, who was a um, distinguished member of our department for many, many years. He joined the university as a professor in 1948 and was a graduate advisor in uh, the Department of Geological Sciences from 1949 to 67. Uh, he supervised a very large number of, of graduate students, uh, 19 PhD dissertations, 126 master's theses, and he was very instrumental in, in leading technical sessions um, and, and, and promoting it as, as a venue for um, uh, presenting research to the department. And so it's very fitting that uh, the DeFord Lecture Series was has been named in his honor. And today we have a very distinguished uh, scholar, um, from um, India, who's gonna be presenting about uh, climate change research in India. And for more information about um, today's speaker, I hand it over uh, to Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, Nyogi. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, distinguished uh, presentation that we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta. Uh, Dr. Akhilesh Gupta is a renowned scientist, um, not just from the context of the, the body of work he has produced in terms of you know his uh, hundreds of papers, the books that he has written, or thousands of reports that he has actually developed. But what is his enduring contribution to the community would be a complete last two decades, he has been single-handedly instrumental in putting India in terms of the climate change, science and technology roadmap, which uh, you know the BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, that whole block of research community uh, that owes its science and technology enterprise in terms of what is going on in India to uh, Dr. Gupta and his leadership. Uh, over the years, he has been the secretary of the University Grants, Grants Commission, which is like the highest uh, university accreditation and funding agency in India. And then he has been in uh, extremely senior positions and leadership positions with the government of India's Department of Science and Technology. Uh, he has been the head uh, in terms of the climate change program for the last 11 years, where we'll, he hosted a series of national missions, series of uh, center of excellences, which is going to talk about some of that. And how did he, uh, from the context of where he stands, develop that vision and conducted this, he is elected member of National Academy of Engineering in India, a elected fellow of the Indian Meteorological Society. Uh, he is an honorary professor in a number of universities. Uh, he has been appreciated by the uh, President's Award uh, by the Government of India. And most recently, he is the main architect of India's not just climate, but the entire science, technology, and innovation policy, which is going to be unveiled 2021. And so he we are very pleased and very honored to have him uh, connect with us and look forward to his presentations and the follow-up partnerships and collaborations that can happen between India and uh, uh, UT. So with that, I will ask Dr. Gupta to uh, please uh, present uh, his perspectives and we'll listen to it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Dave and uh, uh, and let me first at the outset uh, thank the University of Texas uh, for having invited me. So very good evening to all and thanks John, Jessica and Dave for uh, making it possible. So let me uh, begin uh, 
in my talk. I think I divided, uh, this is the suggestion that Dave has uh, given to me that I should also talk about the science and technology innovation policy. So I'll just give some glimpses of that, but I will mainly focus on my, you know, the topic of the talk, the topic of the lecture today, that is climate research in India, progress and vision for 2030. Uh, I thank Dave for your uh, introduction and your background. Uh, it is truly a privilege and honor for me to deliver this talk. Uh, you know, uh, let me, uh, you know, present, uh, this is, uh, let me start with, you know, uh, our presenting how India started its initiative on climate research in, in say, last two decades or three decades, you know. So in fact, in, I try to uh, draw a parallel with the IPCC reports that came up, say, 1990 uh, uh, to now. So the first IPCC report that came in 1990, in fact, we started, uh, you know, initiating some of our initiative rights on that time. So, you know, it's a very uh, famous India the Nitin campaign when the first IPCC had brought out uh, some results which, go, which was uh, going, you know, uh, uh, kind of giving an impression that India's methane emission is coming out to be very huge. We launched a methane campaign and, and then this was one uh, first major kind of work that has been done to show that, you know, so in fact, with that meeting campaign, you know, we could show that, you know, India's paddy budget is only uh, four teragram per year uh, as against the very large amount that was mentioned globally by other scientists. In fact, the, the, when the second, uh, uh, you know, uh, IPCC report came in 1996, around that time, India launched Indian Climate Research Program. And this was again a pan-India big program, uh, uh, which made uh, so much of impact. Uh, and uh, along with that, uh, so many field experiments were also launched. For example, land surface, Process experiment 97, Indian Ocean experiment and experiment in 1999, and Bengal experiment in 1999. These are the three uh, major three lessons, and I uh, is is I have been very fortunate to have been part of all the three. Uh, then uh, came the third assessment report, and this. This made a big change uh, in tech in terms of India's initiative, uh, where you know we initiated an international center for climate research in 2002. After this uh, thing, and uh, also there were two more field experiments: uh, the arrogancy experiment, and then experiment on monsoon variability uh, came up in 2001 and 2002. Then came the fourth assessment report in 2007. And that, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the government of India, in fact, got uh, in completely in action and we launched the what is called the National Action Plan in 2000. And I, I, again, I have been very uh, fortunate to have been one of the authors of National Action Plan of 2008, I was part of a national coordination committee which drafted this plan. Then this plan launched eight national missions and two of them came, were actually given to the government of science technology and uh, later on I became the mission, di mission director of these two missions. And uh, with that, state action plans, different states of India were also launched. Uh, with that, you know, several initiatives started coming. The Department of Science and Technology, in fact, uh, launched several Center of Excellence, and then network program, media R&D program, task forces, state centers, and all. So this uh, came up in in the period of 2008 to 2013 or 14. 
And then 2014, when AR5 came, then uh, further uh, flipped to all these research programs. So basically, if you look at in last, say, one and a half decades, uh, you know, there have been uh, very greater emphasis on the uh, climate research in the, in the country, uh, uh, ranging all kind of initiative, uh, large to small size and covering entire country, uh, and then uh, also addressing the concerns of, uh, you know, international, uh, this is, so as, as per the, as I said, the eight national missions which were launched as a part of the National Action Plan on Climate Change, uh, they were, in fact, four of them are on, were on mitigation, three of them on uh, adaptation, and one was the knowledge mission, that is the research mission, which continued. So, you know, uh, although India, uh, the forte was, you know, to, to have more focus on adaptation, but then we uh, had to focus as part of this mission, uh, for mission uh, on uh, for uh, mitigation. So that shows that you know India has been very uh, conscious about this role, international and uh, domestic, in terms of addressing both mitigation and adaptation. Uh, so uh, th these are the major achievements as part of the climate change program of the government of science and technology as part of the national mission on, on strategic knowledge of climate change. This was knowledge mission, basically focusing entirely on the research part. Uh, we had 12 center of excellence, 23 major R&D program, 13 state climate cells, network programs, human capacity building program, global technology watch program in eight different sectors, vulnerability assessment at district and sub-district level, and several bilateral, including one with US, that is Indo-US Indo Fulbright Kalam Fellowship in Climate Change. This is a very really prestigious fellowship that is started jointly with US and also Indo-German. The other mission was focusing on Himalaya. Uh, that is called National Mission for Sustaining the Himalayan Ecosystem. Now, this was the only mission which was uh, uh, location-specific, and it was focusing on Himalayan region alone. There also large number of initiative were, uh, research initiatives were taken. The idea was that we must be able to address, uh, you know, the sustenance of ecosystem in the Himalayan region, not just uh, climate change, but the other issues like uh, the eco uh, ecosystem management and also the issues related to livelihood and uh, and also the uh, the impact of climate change on the uh, on the overall ecology of the region and uh, as part of this mission we did a kind of you know, what you call the uh, assessment of the health of the himalaya but this was a global concern also that Himalaya is deteriorating in terms of its ecosystem, especially in terms of glaciers, which are, I'll come to this glacier later, but I'm just saying that this was the overall, uh, you know, perspective was to address the Himalaya as a whole, not just in terms of climate change alone. Uh, so these are the centers I'm going to skip because these are all location of the center, may not be of interest to the, uh, to the uh, to you, so I'll skip this. Similarly, Mirra and Nikolam. The important thing is that we try to cover every aspect of the climate change, whether it is sea level rise or the forest ecosystem or agriculture or ocean acidification or and so all that area that kind of uh, has been covered as a part of these uh, and they were center excellence location. So again, it is spread was pan India. So. Uh, almost every major institution in the country had one program uh, from our, uh, as part of this uh, climate change program. Uh, large number of network programs we launched, and that uh, more than 100 projects were there as a part of. And I want to mention here that one very important network program of which uh, they was, uh, in fact, motivation was the you know, urban climate. You know that urban climate is in fact 
becoming more important uh, in fact more than the global climate uh, and especially for the city in india we have a large number of uh, cities where population is more than a million and those cities are changing in terms of not only is their uh, land use land cover but in terms of hydrology climate including the uh, the the uh, uh you can see their uh, heat you know especially that the kind of changes that are taking place in the local level uh, and uh, you, you, we see in 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 some of the city like delhi we have heat island at the at the magnitude of 6 to 8 degree centigrade so that is a cause of concern so i'm not going to detail what i'm saying this was the you know uh there was some of the you know, work that we did as a part of this and one you know india is a, you know it's a, you know we are the largest democracy and you are the oldest democracy so you know these democracies have its own uh, uh, beauty of its, uh, uh, you know governance so we have a federal system where states have equal partnership with the central and therefore uh, the state central states are contributing in a big way towards climate action and we set up these centers they work in tandem with the central government and there is a, a, a kind of connect that we created as a part of this so quantitatively in fact in last say 5 6 years or 7 years good number of research papers came out on these missions and we have good number of technique development the large number of factory development has taken place and uh so it's a, it's a it's a comprehensively um, implemented missions you know with uh, participation of large number more than in fact you look at that 170 projects at 350 institution and 1400 scientists were part of this uh, entire network and in your kind india every state has at least one program uh, from as a part of this thing. let me give just a snapshot of some of the uh, outcome that came out from this this mission i am not going to give uh, uh, complete details because that will be not possible as part of this thing but some glimpses of what we had done so for example we undertook a very detailed uh, all india climate change variability assessment based on the ar5 definition uh, and this was done for the entire india 29 states 690 districts of country and they were uh, they were uh, ranking of states and ranking of districts were done as a part of the team uh, so there were some states found very vulnerable and you know they are mostly on the eastern side of india where they were most and they uh, coincided uh, high vulnerability uh, with the low sdi and that's very and uh, understandable because india has uh, uh, poverty in some of the area and also our population density is quite uh, ha- high especially on the eastern side uh, and also we have a concern on the sdi side because uh, some of the issues like you know health care the uh, the education and all that are concern to us and that impact the vulnerability of the place a uh, district wise 690 uh, district we and we found that some of the states are highly vulnerable this the 70% of the top 100 district uh, are in the in, in, in five states or oh, these are all on the eastern side as i mark with a box you can see that mostly assam bihar jharkhand uttar pradesh odisha had the highest number of such districts and uh, 60 to 90 percent district in three states have very high vulnerability uh, we also work on social vulnerability and they interestingly in some of the places that we have studied found that the social vulnerability has decreased over the last few decades that the uh, the uh, threat or the uh, or the i would say the risk has increased because of the increase in the hydro climatic Uh, disaster and this is the uh, uh, kind of uh, big challenge india is going to face that although we 
uh, might uh, over the time have better vulnerability, uh, both physical and social vulnerability, but uh, we are likely to have more impact of climate change because of the higher risk uh, in, in due to increase in the, uh, you know, in the hydrometeorological disaster because of uh, climate change. Uh, in the glacial side, uh, if you recall that, you know, there were some, a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, kind of controversy came because of, you know, some report of third IPCC and says that Indian glaciers are going to recede very rapidly and they might be uh, dried up over the time. But this, we have done very extensive study and found that although uh, the annual rate of retreat is there is a retreat taking place, uh, but the annual rate of retreat is uh, around average 5 to 20 meter per year. Uh, and there is no abnormal retreat or in, in recent years, although in the previous decade there were some, there were some abnormal uh, retreat of uh, or the or glaciers. So uh, Himalayan glaciers are losing mass. There is no doubt about it at the rate of 6.6 .6 gigaton per annum, which is 0.2 percent. And uh, but what is more important, most important here is that the, the, it is the large, uh, the large glaciers with area more than 10 kilometers square are uh, not likely to be impacted by uh, cl climate change. That we and uh, however, the smaller size of glaciers they they show rapid uh, changes. So there is a good statistic. I think this uh, will explain what I am saying. I think uh, nearly 67% of the total number of glaciers in the Himalaya, they are a small size. So they have volume of less than one kilometer. They have area of less than one kilometer square. But they occupy only 4% of the total area. Uh, and only 13% of the total volume, ice volume. So number is large, uh, but then they occupy small area and small ice volume. However, the 3% uh, of the total number of glaciers in the Himalayan region, they have an uh, area of more than 10, 10 kilometers square. And they occupy 65% of the ice volume and nearly 40% of the area. Now this explains uh, uh, that you know the glaciers of larger size, and they are showing slower retreat compared to the smaller size, and therefore, in general, the statement that glaciers are receding in India and in Indian Himalayan region is very correct. But I am only qualifying my statement saying that these are mostly focused on the smaller size area, so smaller size region. Now, there are studies, you know, I think, there, like, for example, uh, the influence of aerosol on the frequency and uh, intensity of rainfall extreme. This is, of course, generally understood that the aerosols, uh, they have a unique uh, impact where it shows that the uh, uh, both suppression and uh, enhancement of rainfall in different uh, conditions where, you know, the, the, uh, the suppression takes place because of the uh, atmospheric stabilization and the enhancement takes place because of the cloud in, in the evaluation. And so high aerosol buildup will create dry spill, uh, dry spill and then makes uh, the dry spill more drier, whereas the wet still become wet. But I think uh, the scientists understand the reason for this. Uh, I don't have to explain, but you know, the context is that, you know, the aerosol impact on extreme rainfall in India is, in fact, uh, being seen, and especially in the context of monsoon, uh, it has uh, some relevance, especially in the western part of the country. So, uh, this uh, another thing, this is another uh, context is that the aerosol cloud influence. Uh, on this thing. Again, this is the same thing that, you know, these kind of influence on the, uh, you know, the land ocean contrast uh, of these 
ACI observed over the Indian region in almost all season. And so over the sea, the soluble aerosols uh, with abundance of moisture availability create positive ACI, whereas on the land side, especially on the drier region, the dust and slightly soluble uh, organic aerosol, they and less moisture availability create negative ACI. So uh, uh, now uh, there are, I mean, this is the one thing which is seen, uh, uh, you know, in, in India, there, you know, you have, uh, you know, the acting rainfall uh, uh, and the, the diurnal variation taking place. And this is very important, especially the heat wave, you know, there is a trend seen that the western or northwestern part of India, the heat wave is in fact increasing. The traditionally, traditional area of heat wave in India was mostly central India and the, some part of eastern India. We are seeing a different a trend uh, where the eastern India, the heat wave is decreasing and the western part or north western part, the heat wave is increasing, not just in terms of its frequency, but in terms of its duration and intensity. Now, significant change in terms of diurnal variation taking place. So, since the minimum temperature is rising more than the uh, maximum temperature, there is a you know, decrease in the uh, DTR. And that uh, dynamic temperature range is in fact going to impact uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the common uh, or, or the population because the dynamic decreases, then you, know, you have uh, you know, greater impact uh, felt in, you know, for the intense of heat. Uh, this uh, work we have done, in fact, I am co-author of this work on modeling the geoengineering. Uh, the Indian Institute of Science has worked uh, with, I mean, where I have been contributing. And this is just to see whether India can look at the you know, possible impact of uh, the SRM uh, on the monsoon and, and the extreme. And this is very interesting that, you know, there is a, uh, uh, what we did is we injected the, uh, you know, aerosol uh, in the stratosphere and see that whether there's any impact on the, uh, on all other things. So there is a, there are some impact. One impact is that we see that ITC the shift away from the hemisphere of injection. And so, so there is a, uh, this impact is immediately seen in the, uh, in the, in the large scale perspective. Uh, this is a major impact that we have seen. But uh, in the uh, smaller scale or synoptic scale impact also we have seen that it, the rainfall, uh, in fact, uh, monsoon rainfall is decreasing in this, in, in this sphere of hemisphere of injection. And it is as much as 10%. And interestingly, you see, so you see here that, you know, a different uh, latitude, uh, you find that, uh, that, you know, these impacts are seen in, in, in the in hemisphere. So if it is injected in the northern hemisphere, you see the decrease in the rainfall in the northern hemisphere. If it is southern hemisphere, you see the impact there. So this is a, a major uh, change that we have seen. Also, regional monsoon pattern also, I mean, not just in India, but in other part of the world also we saw that wherever you inject, so uh, we find that there is a decrease in rainfall activity. So that explains the reason why, you know, the geoengineering is not a good option uh, if we uh, resort to in case we uh, need in, uh, in, the, in case of climate emergency. Uh, also, uh, you know, uh, persistent drought and uh, uh, you know, is seen when we inject, impact the, uh, we inject the, uh, you know, these uh, uh, aerosols. So, uh, all that's put together, we saw the monsoon rainfall decreasing, overall ICC shifting, and then drought increasing, uh, mm -hmm. gives that impression that, you know, uh, the kind of direction that India must take. Now, this is one study that we, in fact, uh, done by our, uh, you know, uh, scientists at ISC saying that 
we know that alinos are impacting the monsoon you know and positively correlated uh, or negatively correlated so if it is uh, um, el nino there is a monsoon and likely to be uh, to be to be less but uh, uh, but we there, there have been really less number of studies showing that uh, if the uh, when there are drought which are in the non el nino years and those drought were you know they have a different uh, kind of pattern as compared to el nino drought so in the non el nino drought you no know, there is normally the initial uh, monsoon really just moderately good and then you will have a recovery in the august uh, july august and then again Uh, in september or end of august and september you will find that monsoon is going uh, is deficient now such studies are not done and normally we focus mostly on the sigur one study that has given a good insight that you uh, also need to have focus on the non el nino droughts uh, which are in good number not uh, and therefore they are equally important you know that you know uh, the correlation between el nino and drought and the monsoon is weakening and the better correlation is seen with iod and uh, and other uh, you know uh, variability than the el nino so uh, let me uh, i have come to end of my talk uh, just uh, on this issue that now this is the uh, we have in fact prioritized our areas for next 5 years and uh, these are the areas that we are going to focus and I, again i'm not going to elaborate on this for each one of these area we have prepared strategy uh, and they is very much part of some of them so for example glaciology is one area we are going to focus in a big way a national uh, center for glaciology is already there uh, but you know we are going to uh, enlarge its scope and its uh, its its focus uh, also climate modeling in fact we are uh, going to launch a earth system modeling uh, community modeling uh, and this is going to be another area where uh, we will uh, focus on the sea uh urban climate i think uh, is the one area where you know as i said we already have a national network program but i think this is again going to be expanded we currently have three cities as part of this like one is a uh, coastal city one in inland and one is himalayan uh environment we are going to expand this thing a center of excellence in this area also going to come aerosol study also we are going to Uh, expand the network and also create a center of excellence. Uh, extreme events are going to be going to impact India very badly in time to come. So therefore, we are going to focus this on seeing. And of course, Himalaya is very important for us. We already initiated several programs for the Himalaya, and but in time to come, we will have more and more focus on this. Now, let me uh, just mention uh, that you know. uh switch from the climate research to mitigation uh, india has a very different policy on uh, mitigation compared to uh, annex 1 countries where the focus is to create uh, emission cap or emission cut uh, or what we call it emission reduction from the because the the countries have already reached the highest level of Uh, and development india has to go for you know we are at the somewhere at the early stage of development and we need to go uh, for high hdi development now so therefore india's uh, pathway for future has to be different from rest of the world so we have thought of a path which is called instead of cutting the emission or, uh, or reducing the Uh, or uh, what is called the capping the emission we have thought of going for avoiding the emission by bringing directional change in the development pathway uh, this so there are two areas where we are focusing one is the 
creating better energy efficiency and through that better reducing the energy intensity and at the same time uh, create more mix with uh, and renewable energy so that uh, the overall uh, emission comes down uh, through this process. So we focus on evolving a development path that is ecologically sustainable uh, uh, while uh, adopting the mitigation uh, to, the, uh, to, to meet the international uh, challenge. Now, as a part of this uh, national, nationally determined contribution, India um, had, in fact, exceeded some of these targets. We, as I said, we had, uh, as a part of NDC, uh, uh, committed to reduce the uh, emission intensity by GDP by 20 to 25 percent uh, by uh, 2020 and uh, 30 to 35 percent by 2030. So we, in fact, already had achieved in 2014 itself 21 percent of the energy intensity reduction and. Uh, we are continue, continuously working on this and we will achieve some of this target much before time. Another thing that I mentioned was that you know, we are focusing on creating better renewable energy mixed with the total energy. And uh, uh, we had promised that we will uh, achieve this that by 40% cumulative electric power uh, from the uh, renewable by 2030. And on date itself, we have reduced it by 38%. So by 2030, uh, we are in fact going to target much more than what we have already done. So uh, also the uh, India is working on the and, uh, wind energy in a big way. We have we are already become the fourth largest uh, you know wind power producer in the world. But you know we uh, are going to have uh, increase this again. Uh, also, there is one big uh, thing that uh, the, the government had targeted 20 gigawatt of solar power by 2022, and we achieved it by 2018. So now we are targeting 175 gigawatt by 2022 and 460 gigawatt by 2030. Uh, so these are some of the uh, things that let me now uh, come to the part B. You know, uh, as I as they mentioned that I have been uh, part of this formulation of national science and technology innovation policy of the country, uh, and uh, so you know, let me present uh, that you know, in the context of this formulation, we did a mapping of where India is in terms of uh, STI uh, ranking in the world. And you see, uh, and this is uh, some of the uh, parameters that are important here. That uh, the India's gross expenditure has increased three times in the last ten years. Although we have issue with the uh, with the uh, total expenditure as percentage of GDP still continues to be stagnating around less than one percent. So this is uh, is a area of concern that we are going to address. Uh, we, in fact, in terms of uh, number of publication in SCI general, we reached the third position uh, after US and China, but I think we, have, we are still working on this and we need to uh, have more focus on increasing not just the number, but also quality. We also, in terms of number of PhD in science, th at third position, we recently achieved that, but I think uh, we are again continuously working uh, on this so that we can. We had the largest, second largest number of science and technology and engineering and naturally graduate in the world. Uh, fourth position in terms of, uh, sorry, third position in terms of number of startups. This is again a lot of work has been done in recent, area, recent years. And we are fourth in terms of unicorn in the world. So, uh, these are the trend that we are seeing. We are publishing 101, uh, 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 161,000 uh, of research papers, and in, in, in this has gone continuously, uh, you know, on an increasing trend right from the uh, 2020, uh, 2010. So there is a continuous increase in number that we are seeing uh, over the time. A number of startup I already mentioned, I can skip. 
And similarly, number of students, science, technology, and mathematics students are increasing in number. We have our gross enrollment ratio is 28.6%. Uh, of course, uh, no comparison with US, but I think country like India is a good achievement. There are areas where we are, we are done well, but you know, not up to the mark, and we need to continuously work on this. For example, as I said, in, in terms of number of quality, we in fact in the last five, six years, uh, you know, in, uh, had done quite well uh, from 13th position to now 9th position. But I think uh, we need to do a lot on this. The women participate in India uh, in research won double in last seven, eight years, but I think we're still at very low uh, level, that is 18.7, and we need to work on this. Uh, in the terms of patent, no, especially the resident patent filing, we are ninth position, and uh, but much behind India and uh, and the US and China. We need to go uh, work on this thing. Uh, number of researchers, this, is a, this has been one of our weak points, uh, where we are one of the lowest FT in the world, only 255. And that we need to work in terms of uh, total number of researchers per million of population. Uh, in the Global Innovation Index, we had done well in the last uh, five, six years, uh, but I think we are much behind the global best, I think. So these are the areas where we need to work a lot, you know, a good progress in terms of women researchers, I think, but as I mentioned in some of the areas like engineering, uh, our, you know, women researchers and, uh, are much behind. Uh, the, the acceptable limit. Uh, the policy that we uh, have formulated, in fact, which is submitted for final uh, review and uh, this thing, this will be the fifth policy of India on science and technology uh, since independence in 1958, 1983, 2003, and 2013 were the four policies that came up. This is an changing environment. I think we have a different Focus. This policy is very differently prepared, is decentralized, ex expert driven, inclusive, evidence based, and bottom up. And I am privileged to have led this uh, from my secretariat. Uh, and this has been very different experience that I had. Uh, some of the recommendations are that we are, India is going to focus on open science. And open success policy is going to be implemented as a part of national data sharing policy. Uh, we are concerned about the low full time equivalent researcher, and we want to double it or triple it. Uh, private sector uh, participation in India has been very uh, suboptimal. I think we need to focus on there. Uh, although the number of young researchers have increased over the time, but I think we need to focus more on this thing, especially the postdoctoral. We have good opportunity. We are number three in terms of PhDs, but I think the postdoctoral fellowship, we are still, uh, you know, way behind the world best uh, number. Uh, technology indigenization and grassroots innovation. India is the hub for grassroots innovation, and there's so much is being done, and they need to get to the market level. Uh, the frugal innovation in India is also very, very uh, kind of uh, important. And then we are in fact becoming a uh, leader in this in terms of frugal innovation. This needs to be formalized it's, uh, in terms of equity and inclusion and promoting traditional knowledge is very important. Uh, as I said, equity inclusion important in terms of women participation in the research and education. And therefore there we need, uh, say, and not only just as even uh, this is the first policy which in India which brought focus on LGBTQ plus uh, community. Uh, India has given uh, legal uh, rights to them, but you know, uh, bringing them to the research and education has been the, this is the first attempt that we have made. Science communication in India has been taken mostly as a vertical. We need to bring it to the horizontal level, uh, and also uh, we need. Uh, a national innovation system is going to be revisited and we are going to bring so much of virtual innovation into this. And also the innovation is going to be mainstream at the education and research level. 
Uh, we have worked on diplomacy for science for long. We have 80, uh, for bilateral uh, ties with uh, 82 countries in the world. And we are the best, I would say most robust uh, tie and partnership with US, with US. But now we are going to add to that, you know, the science for diplomacy. Uh, with that, we're going to add diplomacy for science. Uh, the, as I said, India is a federal country and therefore state partnership with the state R&D has become very important. So far, the states have not been partnering and uh, for, uh, I would say, uh, for not uh, being very aggressively working with in the R&D, but now we are going to work with them. And then see. I think this ends my, I know I have taken slightly more time, but you know, I think thank you so much for listening to this thing and having patience. I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. Uh, the rarely can we get such a comprehensive uh, overview about the kind of uh, policy making to science and research at a country scale that has been coming out. And uh, we really all appreciate it. There. And uh, repeat that. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, it really gives an insight into, you know, very important um, set of issues in the development of, of climate science and uh, the development of, in, in India. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I, I do have another question for you that I'll, I'm going to hold off for just a second, uh, because I do want to take this opportunity to thank you. And um, even though, you know, we can't see or hear them, I am sure that everybody in the in the uh, webinar universe is uh, giving a round of applause.